I would start saying uh, to everyone, welcome to Chavista Chronicles from Caracas. Uh, and today we're going to have Susan Rose uh, as, as, as our interviewee, and I'm going to introduce her. Susan Rose is a clinical psychologist. She has been active since the U.S. War in Vietnam in the International Solidarity Movement. Uh, uh, and in the past 10 years, uh, with four visits to Venezuela to support the Venezuelan struggle for self-determination in the face of U.S. intervention and aggression. Uh, she started supporting Mumia Abu Jamal case when he was on the death road and scheduled for execution in 1995. She has been part of the building of a, an amazing Mumia movement, which continues to grow and, and fight the state. In addition to supporting Mumia, uh, they have been supporting all our political prisoners in the US. She, uh, See, our, see ourselves as a struggle. I mean, the committee see itself as struggling for decarceration against police control and challenging the white supremacist legacy so deeply rooted in the history of US slavery. She was also coordinator of the Free Mumia Ruya Mal Coalition in New York for more than 10 years, working closely with the founding organization of the movement, the International Concerned Family and Friends of MAG for which uh, she has been an international spokesperson. So thank you, uh, Susan, for being with us today. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, nothing makes me happier than connecting my work here with the, the heroic struggle, just struggle of the people of Venezuela. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. I know that. Um, and before they start in the question, I was really, I was watching the, the, the news a few minutes ago, and I hear President Biden talking about demanding Putin to respect human rights. <laughs> and I was thinking in our interview, and I said, wow, this guy is in Washington. What are... oh, did he ask for to respect the human rights? <laughs> human rights. Who did he ask to respect the human rights? Who was he asking? Putin. Russian Vladimir Putin. Okay. <laughs> he was talking about the summit that they are planning, and he said that he's gonna be strong, asking him to respect human rights. And I was thinking, wow, I'm gonna comment this to Susan. I'm so glad, to see. It's one of wow. my favorite subjects um, to talk about. Yes. Yes, and in international work. I always say that, um, you know, people ask, why do I do so much international work or something, you know, whatever. So there are many reasons, of course. But to me, one of the best ways to challenge U.S. imperialism, U.S. violation, constant violation of basic, basic human rights, basic human rights, the violation in this country is, I mean, <clears throat> we've seen all the stuff around um, the killing of young black men in particular. And um, there's so many issues like that. But um, so in a very fundamental. Listen, listen, I have some problem with it. Can you unmute the, the, I believe that somehow uh, the, the, the audio is muted. Can you unmute it? Will you be able to hear me? Now, now I hear you. Sorry okay. about that. I really, that is something that I click here. Okay. So um, one of the things that I always say when, the, when, when uh, I go to other countries, uh, especially countries that the United States is trying to discredit, like Venezuela or Cuba or Bolivia, countries that I've been in um, numerous times, you know, I always say, well, the best thing to do is to have a press conference when they say that, when the United States um, uh, criticizes Chavez or, criti you know, the way it used to, or refers to, even the progressive media has referred <coughs> to President Maduro as a dictator. I cringe democracy now about two years ago, maybe less than that. That's uh... President Maduro. And this is 
This was said by somebody, a Latino person, a Puerto Rican, long time, somebody who was a young revolutionary. I knew him when he was young and he's, you know, he's still progressive, but that he referred to Chavez, to no, Maduro, to Maduro as a dictator and that they talk seriously about the opposition in Venezuela. I just say, take out these pictures of all the violation of human rights in this country. Take out the pictures of people. And I, I was just hearing an interview today of somebody who spent years and years in isolation, in the prison, in isolation. He was put in isolation when he was 15 years old, a child put in isolation, was in prison for maybe 20, 30 years and just recently got out and he's amazing. I mean, you know, miraculously people survive and do amazing things. But the, the human rights in this country are so outrageous. I, you know, sometimes when I look at the police and I'm white and privileged and an older woman, the police are more inclined to be protective toward me than they are toward a young black man, of course. But still, when I see them, there's a police, a very, very um, repressive, particularly dangerous police station in my neighborhood in Washington Heights. And I, I once had to go in there for something. I, you know, when you lose something, you have to go into the police station. Anyway, I go in, I see blood all over, blood on the floor all over. I mean, it's shocking the level of, and, and just the brutality of the police at demonstrations. They, you know, I mean, I look at them and I say, oh my God, who are these people? You know, they don't look good. So, you know, anything, anything that when the United States talks about human rights in any other country or in Iraq or whatever, all the, you know, years back, Vietnam, excuse me. <laughs> I saw that the United States recently asked Vietnam <laughs> asked Vietnam if it could use its route to protect itself against China. Oh, <laughs> so, I mean, that is nerve. You have to say that's nerve <laughs> to ask Vietnam. Yeah. Anyway, don't get me off on tangents. Yeah. Uh, there are many yes, stuff yes, to, yes. Speak about, to speak about. <laughs> let, me, let me go to the questions because uh, 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 that will yeah, eventually, yeah, not eventually, immediately will take us to the same issue. So I'm going to start with the first questions that we talked about beforehand. And, and it is, uh, I just want you to update us about the Mumia's case and his current health condition, whatever you know about his, okay. his case and, and where is he and where the scene is moving towards. I follow him all the time. Of course, I know where he is and so on and communicate with him. And uh, <clears throat> since uh, the pandemic, I haven't visited him, but otherwise I used to visit uh, pretty regularly. So Mumia's case from the get go, from the very beginning, was a travesty of justice in any by any standards. Amnesty Amnesty International, which is not a radical, you know, left organization, it's one of these yeah. human rights organizations that you know with many contradictions. But Amnesty International's judgment about about Mumia's trial back in um, 1990, the, the original trial was in 1992. In 1982, and then Amnesty's report, and then there was an appeals process starting in 1995, and Amnesty's report came out in the year 2000. And it, it blasted, it really blasted the whole trial and the appeals process and the judge <clears throat> and the involvement of the, the, the gross racism of the judge. The judge, I don't know if you heard this, I mean, it's one of the stories that's well known. I have a Pardon me? Okay, I hear you. Okay, one of the stories about the judge that he was overheard in a courtroom next to his telling another colleague, I'm going to help them fry the, and he used the N word. I'm going to help them fry the N word, meaning the nigger. I'll say it so that you know what I'm talking about. And what he meant was that he was going to collaborate with the prosecution. The prosecution. There we go, some, some kind of sound again, right? Yes, yes, but I fix it. I fix it. You can go on, I can hear you. So, um, Amnesty 
Amnesty International said the judge, you know, oozed the racism, his contempt for the for Mumia. <clears throat> Mumia was a well-known journalist when he was arrested. He was um, a young, up-and-coming, brilliant, recognized as a brilliant young journalist uh, who covered stories that nobody else did and who fast. I have a friend who lives in, actually, she's one of the coordinators of the Mumia work. She said, when Mumia, uh, when she first heard about his reports, he spoke on the black radio stations. When anything happened, she would rush home so that she could hear Mumia's report because she could never get that kind of information for anyone else. And he was a, 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 a leader in the, as a very young age in the Black Panther Party and um, wrote, you know, interviewed people like Ossie Davis, like um, uh, what's the great um, Jamaican singer? Um, Bob, Marley. Bob, Marley, Bob Marley. He interviewed Bob Marley. He interviewed all these people. And, and he also did something, and this will lead us into the second subject that we're going to cover. Um, this completely quotes disreputable, supposedly uncivilized, barbaric organization, the MOVE organization, which many, many people didn't take seriously. And he, with his brilliance, saw that there was something special there. And he began following them around all the time and reporting on them. And so when everyone was saying they're dirty and they don't, that children don't go to school and all these things, he would quote John Africa, their leader, and he would quote, and he would tell the complexity of a story. So instead of just saying, you know, they disrupted something, he would explain what they were disrupting and then explain the political message behind what they were doing. So he became very well known and very much hated by the establishment because he was so charismatic, uh, very un incredible. I don't know if you ever heard him, his, his voice is incredible. He has the natural voice for speaking. He, he's a natural, I always say, tell him when I see him, I've often said to him, you remind me of Paul Robeson because he has that brilliance, those politics, that courage and that voice and that voice. So um, that's uh, how Mumia appeared on the scene and they began to, the, 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 the powers that be, the powers, that, and I mean um, the corporate powers, the political powers, the police, the police in Philadelphia is very strong, less strong now than 10 years ago, but at that time could do anything. They could do anything. And uh, the, the mayor, when Mumia first appeared on the scene is the notorious uh, Frank Rizzo. Frank Rizzo was police chief for many years and was known for his brutality. He would line up high school kids, came to demonstrate peacefully. Black high school kids were demonstrating and he had the police beat them up brutally. He would often make people undress in public to humiliate them. He did very, very shocking things that were not considered even vaguely acceptable. And ultimately he became the mayor of Philadelphia. And that same police mentality um, dominated his whole way of working as the mayor. And um, he was quoted as saying something like, um, you know, with MOVE having been such a, a a thorn in his side for so long. He'd say something, he was quoted as saying something like, um, I know what we'll do. I know what we, the only way we're going to get rid of them is to kill them. And um, there's no question that they intended to kill Move. There's no question mm -hmm. that's what, and there's no question that they intended to kill Mumia. So just to introduce the subject, Mumia was a young revolutionary but he also became quickly um, someone who supported the MOVE organization. You know, they don't have membership like that. It wasn't, they don't like, but he was clearly, and to this day, all his messages from prison 
and he get, sends out about at least once or twice a week a message. <clears throat> All the message ended end with the phrase, long live John Africa. And every single uh, letter I've ever gotten from him ends or email ends long live John Africa. So his commitment to the politics and the vision of MOVE is very deep. And um, it's not surprising that right now, and I don't know uh, whether I'll have to introduce the subject or you know something about it, and I don't know if the listeners, I don't really know who your listenership is. So that always puts, uh, makes it a little harder because uh, I don't know if people. It's mainly uh, US uh, solidarity movement Oh. Uh, most of readers and watchers are from the US and Canada. Okay. Because we basically do like uh, English news uh, about Venezuela. So so that's our main audience. Okay. So I know a lot, I probably know a lot of them, <laughs> including the ones in Canada, the ones in British Columbia. I've met them both in, Ve in Venezuela and in the United States. Um, so, um, I lost my train of thought. What was I talking about? No, uh, you were talking about MOVE and the commitment of UMIA. Uh, with, uh, uh, so right now, there's a major issue that's come up. You know, um, the MOVE people were uh, arrested. The first, the, the large group of people that spent many, many years in prison, 40 years in prison, 41 years in prison, were, um, there were nine of them back in 1978. They were arrested and they were sentenced for the killing of a policeman, which all the evidence was that they didn't, that the shot came from um, uh, an angle and the side of the street where it couldn't have been from them. They were in the basement of a house and it looked like the shot came from across the street above level at any rate, because they were the rage at move was so intense. They, um, the judge sentenced all nine of them. One shot killed one policeman. And the judge said, well, they call themselves a family, so I'm gonna sentence them like a family. And in fact, it was uh, Mumia, as a journalist, Mumia was still out at the time, 1978. Mumia got to interview this judge, got to ask a question on a radio. He somehow man managed to squeeze and he says, um, Judge Malamud, what is, um, who, who do you think killed uh, the, the policeman? And he said, I have no idea. But he had just sentenced them to 40 years. And so that came out that he said he had no idea. Mumi was able to get that answer from him. And that completely raised questions, of course, about what kind of justice there was if the judge himself is saying that. So there was, they have been in prison. They were in prison from 1978 until a few years ago they finally began releasing them with a, after a huge campaign to grant, they, they were there on parole. They could have gotten parole much earlier, but they were refusing to give them parole and with a lot, a lot of pressure. They finally got out a few years ago, all of them. Two had died in prison under very suspicious circumstances. Both suddenly developed an illness, were dead within two days. <clears throat> um, the others got out, one died in, uh, within, a few months after coming out um, with cancer, all three had, had got developed cancer while in prison. I mean, prison conditions are horrendous and the death, the rate of death is high and so on. So <clears throat> the MOVE situation was relatively quiet for a long time. I mean, they've have, they have been supporting Mumia, they were speaking about what it was like to be in prison, but on just a few weeks ago, on April 23rd, news came out, bizarre, bizarre news. And it'll lead us into the whole issue of white supremacy and how deep it is in this country. So it's a very interesting and very significant issue that came out, very upsetting, of course, to the family but, and to those of us who are close to them, but very instructive. So on April 23rd, somebody from the anthropology department at the University of Pennsylvania got word out that the, the remains of two of the children who were 
I'm skipping around, so I hope from the 19th. Don't worry, don't worry. Okay, people have to follow up. People be creative. <laughs> Open your ears wide. <laughs> So uh, from the bombing of the MOVE headquarters, not the, not the one in 1978, but in 1985, what MOVE always says, they came to finish it off. What they weren't able to do in 1978, they just locked up nine people. In 1985, they came and dropped a bomb. I mean, they attacked this house and everything and then dropped an actual bomb that not only killed all the um, 11 people, six adults and five children, but also destroyed 61 houses in the neighborhood, in a black middle-class neighborhood. 61 houses were destroyed because not only did they drop, but not only did they try attack it with water and explosives and ultimately a major bomb, but they let the fire go on for a full day the fire kept burning and the fire trucks were there and didn't do anything. So there was a conscious attempt to destroy everything. Erase. Right. Yeah. And, so, and then, <clears throat> so <clears throat> on April 23rd, just very recently, information came out <clears throat> that of those five children, two of them, their remains were not buried and they found them. Miraculously, after all, this is, we're talking about 1985, and this is 2021. And <clears throat> more shockingly, the bones were used for teaching. And um, this woman, Professor Janet Mong, M-O-N-G-E, <clears throat> had an, um, a course she taught online for 5,000 students. 5,000 students watched her talk about these bones and she was saying they're juicy, juicy meaning that there's still some life. They're not, they're not really very old. So that's relatively recent, I guess, 1985. Well, of course that created an immediate scandal because you know, by any religious standards, first of all, you're supposed to show some respect for the dead, even if you didn't show any respect for them when they were living. So number one, to kill. I, I, I believe that it's very important that you talk about that because I, I, I when, when I organized the meeting, I mean, the interview, I mean, when, I, when we decided to do the interview, I start digging around the whole issue and hearing about the case. But a lot of people do not know that, I, I believe. And I, I was not aware of that. Uh, first, I was not aware of the bombing of the MOVE organization. And I was not aware of the recent incident with the bones and the remains of the kids. The so I really was shocking to a lot of us. You mm -hmm. know, we didn't know. We didn't know the family. <clears throat> the mothers are living. The mothers of those children are alive. And first of all, well, there's a lot to say about it. So first, let me say that in the struggle, you know, the university of course was apologetic, was sorry, it was a mistake, this was an accident. We don't know exactly what happened. We'll have an investigation. How can you have an investigation when somebody has been teaching 5,000 students with bones that are identified. She spoke, said, this professor said, these are the bones of a child that died in a bombing that, that happened. She told the facts. I don't know how, how sympathetically she described it, but she definitely described the facts. So not only do we have a case of murder for which no one ever paid any price, the only people who went to prison were one of the MOVE people. Two, two people survived that fire. We don't, nobody knows how they survived. One was Ramona Africa, who is a well-known leader of the MOVE organization and a friend of mine. I mean, I, she's known, widely known. And um, she survived and she came at one of the most poignant scenes of all movies that there've been quite a few films done about it. But the most poignant scenes is seeing Ramona walking out of this burnt down building, this building that still is on fire and she's burnt. 
she's burnt, holding a child's hand. One of the children survived. And, you know, when you see it and you understand what this is a picture of, a woman who survived this fire with her family and friends and people dying and the little boy, you know, and his he was, I think, 11 at the time. And um, Ramona was the only one who went to prison. No official, not one policeman, not one fire chief, not one, nobody, you know, with clear murder in everybody's eyes, a, a bomb was dropped. Ramona coming out burnt, then has to go to prison. She went to prison for, I think it was 10 years or 11 years, something like that, because they would have let her out earlier. And this is typical of MOVE, if, they, if she had agreed to break off all relations with the MOVE organization, of course she wouldn't. And um, so she, she had to serve the full term, what we call max, she had to max out. So that's the story of, uh, so today, as this case is going on with the bones and the remains, um, the officials are trying to cover their you know what, and they say, uh, well, listen, we'll apologize. Do you want money? What do you want? And they say, look, we, you can't bring back our family that you killed. You can't do, the only thing we want is Mumia to be released. And uh, that's again, very typical of MOVE um, that, you know, my, what's money to a group that, for, who've given up their lives and to say, we want Mumia free. That's what we're demanding. So um, that's the link to give you just in full circle, the story of Mumia and the relationship of Mumia and MOVE and um, how they're related. And essentially you'd have to say that Mumia went to prison because of MOVE. Since he clearly didn't kill the policeman, he's not guilty. It's always been obvious that this case was a frame up why did they want him? Why, why did they have to kill him? I mean, why were they trying to kill him? Because they were trying to kill him and they've tried to kill him several times. They tried to kill him twice. They were gonna execute him. He actually had two execution dates, one in 1995, the other in 1999. And both time the worldwide movement made it impossible. They couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. I mean, we had people here, 1999, we had thousands of people in the street in Philadelphia with uh, contingents from France, from Germany, from all kinds of Japan, people came from all kinds of places to support Mumia. His case, as you know, is very, very popular around the world. Even recently when he was very sick, you know, I was getting the mail, a lot of mail and, you know, uh, I was getting solidarity statements from Algeria, from Senegal, from Brazil, huge number of statements from Brazil. And the biggest one was, um, I mean, the most prestigious one, I shouldn't say the biggest one, the most prestigious one was from the National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa, which has uh, 360,000 members. I mean, it's, uh, and they wrote a very strong way. So we were getting every day statements from all over the world. And in the end, in the end, meaning after a few weeks, when word got out that Mumia was in the hospital and was being shackled in the hospital for shackled two, two wrists and two ankles and that he wasn't allowed to see anyone. Nobody knew where he was. And we could guess because there are only a few hospitals in Pennsylvania near the prison, but we didn't know for sure. They wouldn't tell his wife. They wouldn't tell his lawyer. They wouldn't tell any doctors, nobody. And finally, because of the demonstrations, which were nonstop and the phone calls and the emails and so on. <clears throat> they did two things. They, um, they let his wife speak to him every morning for 15 minutes and they took off and the shackle removed. They took off two of the shackles. He could have two shackles. And the shackles was really, the removing of those shackles was really in response to the Human Rights um, Council of the United Nations, which issued a statement that had um, the headline, I don't have it right in front of me. The headline was something like, elder um, is shackled in out outrageous, something outrage about the shackling and demanding that he not be shackled. This is, came from the United Nations Human Rights Council. So 
Human Rights Commission. So that 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 I think had an that has an impact. I mean, how can Biden talk about human rights with Putin, and then have huge propaganda? My fantasy is, and I know I'm skipping ahead, but my fantasy has been on numerous occasions that you know hundreds of delegates will come from around the world to Washington DC and say we want them give them to us you know we'll take them to our country we'll take them to our country you know there's a street there's streets named all over the world for after i mean not, not all over the world but in numerous places in saint denis which is a suburb of, of paris um, an immigrant an immigrant uh, community, 100,000 people. It's a small town, really, in Mosa, in Saint Denis. There was a huge, huge battle to name a street after him. And uh, the battle wasn't with the people of France. The battle was a, with the Fraternal of Order of Police here in the United States, which waged a campaign against the French, saying, You can't um, I, let this street be named after a cop killer. You know, that's outrageous. And we want an apology and we want you to, what did they want? They wanted to, to change the name and um, something else. Oh yes, and to issue a statement to honor policemen everywhere. <laughs> and uh, the French said, go to hell. <laughs> <You know? clears throat> this is our country. They were very good, I have to say. Um, the French Communist Party mostly, that's a lot of it was from the Communist Party but they're strong in labor movement and they were able to um, mobilize. And that street, it, we just, two years ago, we went there for the 10th reunion. I've been, I was there four different times at that little street, which made the fraternal order police so crazy. They took it to every legislative body in the United States they could, including the Congress, the US Congress, and tried to get, and passed resolutions everywhere denouncing it. You know, and the French couldn't care less, you know, I mean, the French could be arrogant in a positive way, <laughs> you know. So anyway, um, the domination of the police is a big story around Mumia. It's really a big story. And they have wanted him. And around, and around human rights in the U.S. in general. In general. You know, the brutality and the police mafia so, in well, the U.S. Is it's one of the main issues. Absolutely. And Mumia embodies, <clears throat> Mumia is in a pit, embodies so much of what the United States is about. So much. He was framed by the police, by people who love the police, like Mayor Rizzo. He was um, um, then again and again and again. The trial was controlled by the police. His trial was close. The judge was a friend of the police. The judge on the case was a close friend of the police. Everything <clears throat> about his case is the police. And they, you know, I've been, a, <clears throat> we would go to demonstrations at police headquarters in Philadelphia. There'd be a big banner outside. It said, Fry Mumia. And our banner, of course, would say, Free Mumia. And their banner would say, Fry Mumia. And um, that was typical of how they related. And anytime there was any opening in the case, they would uh, bring out the, the, the widow of the cop that was killed. She'd been remarried long ago and she would come on, oh my God, you know, my poor husband, he's, I lost my husband and here you are about to give Mumia a chance for a new trial or whatever it was. And um, when Mumia was finally taken out of death row and put in general population, um, of course, the police didn't like that. And she said, well, I hope the people in there like him will take care of him, meaning that they'll kill him. And Mumia loved every time I visited him, people come over to him in the visiting room and shake his hand and when he was sick, he's always been protected by other prisoners. He's very, he's a very, um, he's a very loving person. He's very charming. He's very respectful. He doesn't have a touch of arrogance. For someone that's smart, you would expect, you know, 
none of that intellectual pretentiousness. He doesn't, he's not like that. He's the people person. And, um, you know, the children who come to visit their fathers in the prison, he's always paying attention to the children, the little kids who come and tells the father, you know, your children are beautiful. I mean, very, very, very likable like that. And she always is so full of venom, this woman and the police, blood, 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 they really want blood. So um, in a nutshell, legally, physically right now, he's doing okay. He recovered from a surgery and he's doing okay. Um, but that can't last very long. He's um, 67 years old. He has had trauma after trauma. He has cirrhosis of the liver. He now has a, uh, just had the bypass, the heart bypass, because he had two um, arteries that were blocked. He also had COVID and people have a lot of sub, you know, lasting effects sometimes when he has high blood pressure. He doesn't have good food in the prison. He doesn't get to exercise enough. His life is in danger. His life, as far as I'm concerned, his life is in danger. He looks healthy, he works, he tries very hard to exercise, but half the time they don't allow it, you know, no exercise. This day it's raining, whatever. <clears throat> so uh, the prognosis for him if he stays in prison is not good. The health prognosis if he stays in prison is not good. Legally, in December of 2008, an amazing thing happened in this case. An amazing thing. In fact, I got a friend of mine who's an artist to do a special banner of celebration for that event when he did this. You make me drink water too. <laughs> do it, do it. <laughs> so in 2008, for the first time, Mumia had a judge <clears throat> who was not a friend of the police. He was not a friend, I don't know, of the police, but he was not a member of the Fraternal Order of Police, the so-called Union of Police. He was not a member, he was not a supporter. First time in the history, in the history of his case, which goes back to 1982, 1981. Also, also a black man. So his name's Leon Tucker. He was black, not, a, not related to the police, a Republican. So we didn't know what to expect, right? He was, um, this is the, on the lower court, Philadelphia court. And the case was going back to him after all these years, because somebody, a judge on the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, Ronald Castile, <clears throat> had also been in the district attorney's office on the lower court. So he was on the lower court where Mumia was sentenced and all that. And then he was on the Supreme Court when cases were coming, cases were coming before him, appeals about Mumia's case. <clears throat> Mumia's lawyers twice applied for him to recuse himself, to recuse himself, to remove himself from the case because of by potential conflict of interest. I mean, any child would know that you can't be on the case at one stage and then rule on the same case and be supposedly neutral. So he refused, he said, I'm not, I'm not biased. He had the right to refuse the judge and he refused twice. We also had a grassroots campaign to remove him. And you know, so there was a huge pressure to have him removed, but he refused. So he stayed on the case. Lo and behold, in 2018, right? I'm talking about 2018, two years ago, three years ago, <clears throat> another case came up with the same judge and the same issue and a higher court ruled, the United States Supreme Court ruled that it was a conflict of interest. Miracle of miracles, <clears throat> the case opened up and the judge, this judge ruled that all the appeals that came before this judge had uh, came before the United States, uh, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, while the judge, this judge was on that court, <clears throat> now had a right to be reviewed. So that was phenomenal because 
there's so many, the, the, the case was so outrageous and so many things were, so many principles of fairness were violated over and over again. So we were ecstatic, you know, this was the mm-hmm. first big break in the case. So you won't believe it. <laughs> Cause I mean, those of us who, I mean, if, you, if you're in a movement or in struggles as you obviously are, um, things sometimes come as surprises. So that was a surprise, but an equal surprise negatively was that for the first time in the history of Pennsylvania, of Philadelphia, a so-called progressive person had been elected as district attorney. His name is Krasner. Um, <clears throat> I want to get his first name because I always get it. I, I, I knew somebody else with that name and I confused them. But anyway, <clears throat> his name is Krasner. And uh, Larry Krasner, Larry Krasner. Larry Krasner had defended many uh, activists against police brutality, was by all measurements, measures, seemingly a progressive. He had fought for bail, for, for people to not demand high bails, you know, for poor people, all kinds of good things he had fought for. And lo and behold, he was now the district attorney and people were saying, oh my God, what a godsend. The moment he opened up his mouth on this case, I was suspicious. I, I smelled a deal. So he has done some good things. He has released 19 people from prison who were there for long periods of time. He got them released because he fought for the injustice of the trial and issues like that. He has definitely lowered the bail for lots of people. He has spoken up against the police. The police hate him. The police hate him. But in my own way, I have to say I hate him too. I don't hate him because I don't speak that way, but I, he's, I, I don't see him as a friend at all. I don't see him as, and I'm, I'm not speaking just for myself. Uh, it would be hard to be a Mumia supporter. And um, so when this judge made this ruling, opening up all this process now, he has fought it tooth and nail. Tooth and nail. He has said that, um, I mean, in a nutshell, because it's been a few years and there's a lot of things he's done. But one of the things he's done is he said it's too late. He has essentially spoken with the same voice as the state, as the right wing, as the police. You would think he's with them. If you didn't know the other facts about him, you'd say, oh, this is the man who works with the police. He's been absolutely any kind, and he's, he not only has said that it's too late, and then he says um, that there's no evidence that he's not guilty, 100% guilt. You'd have to be a fool to say that, and certainly a progressive person. So, you know, you, could, uh, you can figure out, I, my own feeling was, and he played a good role in allowing the move people to be released. He didn't fight it. He, didn't, he wasn't responsible for the being, but he didn't fight it. So, you know, to me, it's pretty obvious that the deal was made that he could get away with this much as long as he mm-hmm. doesn't. And Mumia is that still makes- the most hated, the most dangerous, the most famous person. So that's the situation. And the most, and the most hated by police. The most hated by police, exactly. So, um, and you know, the police don't play. The police, um, they're very violent, as you know, as you see. Uh, one of Mumia's lawyers back around in the 90s, um, I can't remember what he had done. He was no, a known um, movement lawyer. He was active in the Leonard Wineglass. He was well known at the time. And um, the police came up to his hotel room in Philadelphia one night. And when they left, he was shaking. And someone who saw him said he looked really white. You know, his face had paled. He was, you know, the police threatened. So if the police comes and says something to you, you know, 
but you don't play and you're dead. I mean, a, a bunch of witnesses, me and witnesses disappeared, disappeared, were killed, whatever. People who spoke up, you know, and, and, and several people were afraid to testify. Mumia's brother was afraid to testify at one point. You know, I mean, because they basically destroy your business. They, you know, the, the power of the police to retaliate is unbelievable. And when I was listening to, I happened to listen on the radio today, this, uh, about this person who had been in prison, uh, been in isolation at age 15. And he described what they would do if what the police, the, the prison guards would do in the prisons if you didn't cooperate, if you raised questions, if you challenged them, if you reported anything, what would happen to you? What would happen to you? So people know. Listen, Suzanne, I, I want to jump to the second question in order to keep track of the things. Okay, but basically, uh, what, I, what I understand from what you said is like, like that there is a chance disregarding the, the deal with this new attorney uh, that uh, prosecutor I mean uh, that, that there might be a chance for some good development in the case of Mumia. that's my, my what I believe is gonna or not it's I mean miracles happen and um, uh, you never know not just miracles but you know people's victories happen sometimes in unforeseen ways so we never give up, but I really think this depends on more likely is like, like I was saying, if, if a few hundred people came from around the world to Washington, that's more yes, likely. And I, and I want to mention about that. I, I want to let you know that a lot of people here in Venezuela know about the Umia's case and, and, and you have all our solidarity. Uh, I mean, uh, I want you to know that there are a, a lot of people here in Venezuela that follows the case and that, that are, I believe that they are going to be willing to support any initiative that you have. So you just let me know and I will try to do whatever possible to support. We have been trying for Norinoco Tribune to, to, to support and, and highlight the most recent events on the case. But anyway, I just wanted to let you know that we are here. I love and you. I, and I, and love I also want to go ahead, go ahead. And I will tell Mumia specifically. And you know, I brought a message to, to Caracas on President Chavez's last birthday on this earth. I brought a birthday greeting from Mumia that was played on public radio for 24 hours on the day of Chavez's birthday. I happened to be there on his birthday. So we have the same feeling of solidarity for the Venezuelan struggle. To me, that's what the anti imperialist movement is about that kind of reciprocal support. Of course, of course, I, uh, the pandemic has kept me from Venezuela recently, um, but I hope to come back. And um, I appreciate hearing that. I will definitely tell Mumia that immediately. I will please, please, please do. And I wanted also to jump to the second question, but we already, you already talked about it, but I wanna read it just in case. I yeah. wanted to ask you about the move uh, I mean, the whole move issue, uh, right. what it is and what are the recent trends and developments, and we already talk about it, but I don't know if you want to add something else. I won't have to repeat it, but I can say that this revelation was chilling uh, because the barbarism of, you know, how universities, the bourgeoisie, the bourgeois universities are so pretentious and claim to be the center of civilization. And um, uh, they love to portray themselves as super civilized. And, and MOVE has always been characterized as having no civilization, you know, barbaric, uneducated, all that. And the contrast between MOVE's dignity and love for their children and love for their family and how they've responded to this as compared to the university hustling to cover up the barbarity of what they've done. And uh, for people who know, I mean, you know, I went, uh, by the way, I got a PhD in psychology. <laughs> you had mentioned masters, I think, but anyway, it doesn't matter. I went to Columbia and when I studied at Columbia, I became, I was young and I didn't understand a lot. 
and I knew something was really wrong with the morality. And I learned from the student uprising in 1968, I learned a lot about the behind the scenes, the university's collaboration with the war in Vietnam, the university's collaboration with the eviction of black people from the neighborhood, all these things. Well, anthropology was always considered one of the worst academic subjects. The worst, I mean, the, the worst field, professional field in terms of white supremacy, because so much of the anthropologists and those who study bones and skulls and stuff like that, the, to skip a lot of steps, turns out that a lot of the research, the purpose of it is to show the inferiority of black brains. Mm -hmm. Black white people's skulls are better or whatever, you know, whatever it is. And that, that that's what comes out uh, in all of this has come Lisa, out. The, Lisa, Lisa, that, thing, that takes me to the third question. Let okay. me read it to you because it's connected exactly with what you're talking about. Please give, give us your impression on the status of the systemic racism that prevails in the U.S. Is there any hope? Was what I wrote? The greatest hope. The greatest hope. There are a couple of things. One, of course, the movement. The people, young people in the streets were phenomenal. The courage they had in fighting the police after um, the killing of George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd, the, the largest demonstrations ever in the history of the United States. Nonstop in New York, the police was vicious. They would lock, they would try to uh, enclose um the protesters in streets where they couldn't escape and then they would tear down to gas them they would set up all of a sudden announce a curfew when there was no curfew before so in 10 minutes you have to be out of the street and if not so all of this happened i went to the demonstration two days after these bones were discovered and revealed i went to a demonstration in philly I, i'm in philadelphia a lot Philadelphia is a very revolutionary, potentially revolutionary city. It's really amazing things happen there. Just to skip for a minute and tell you, there was Rizzo, I've talked about Rizzo before, Mayor Rizzo, the, the fascist mayor. He was, there was a huge bronze statue of him, huge. I mean, I would look up and it was like six times my height or something like that, right across the street from City Hall. Fancy, a lot, a lot of money. The student, the young people kept protesting against it, threatening to take it down, take it down, take it down. It was finally taken down two years ago. And you know what there is on that same area? There's a mural, a magnificent mural of black women who are leaders in Philadelphia, starting with Ramona Africa, the sister who survived the bombing, Pam Africa, who's the leader of the Mumia movement, and then a, a number of black young women who have been part of the Black Lives Matter movement. That is such a victory to take down that statue and have these women there right across the street from City Hall. And right now, the, the, at that demonstration, when I came there, I was, it was so somber. You know, every, people were either in tears or just very, very silent. I didn't say a word. I'm always noisy at demonstrations. I was just so quiet. I just watched, you know, and was so moved by it. Several hundred people marched. And within one day, I think it was like four or 500 people came to out. Of those, 35% were University of Pennsylvania students, white students, white students. To me, that is a major turn. And Princeton, which was the other university that was involved with these bones, also has this kind of and bizarre research. Also, Princeton is the elite of the elite. And Princeton, also white students were coming out in opposition. So the fact that the consciousness of the people, you know, understanding racism, people, people hide racism, people deny racism, people say, Oh, it's an idea over there, but not here. I mean, the, all the defenses, and I'm a psychologist, all the defense mechanisms that are used to deny, this time, a lot of them dropped. A lot of them dropped. And a lot of people had to say, these people, because even religious people, even if you don't support Mumia Bujimala move, but you know, you don't 
desecrate the dead like that. You don't kill them and then torture their bodies and and try to show that they're <coughs> inferior brains, no less. So mm. that's my greatest hope, the change in the right. people. It's nice to hear that because sometimes I see that there's no hope there. I know. Let me tell you. When uh, people get it's to, nice to hear you. Yeah, so so it's definitely depressing after a day while while the Chauvin, the cop, is convicted, another black person nearby, a young black person yes. has been tortured. Yes. But the consciousness of the people, I think, is definitely changing. And I that that's very inspiring. That's very inspiring and very important. Because in the end, you know, we all believe that the people have to change this the it can't come from the top down. It's not about laws. We're going to turn to Biden, <laughs> you know, the solution. They have to, at some point, people have to realize there's something wrong about thinking that this is so sick. Or color, uh, you are superior to. Even the same with Israel. I mean, I'm jumping to something, but in the yeah. United States, Israel has been such a holy issue. And people are changing and are saying, oh my God, all these children. Why they kill these children? And I just, you know, those kinds of stories. So they're very moving. So that gives me hope. The fact that there's some wonderful, wonderful young revolutionary activists in a place like Philadelphia, and I happen to see them, the new generation of activists are very impressive. Very impressive. Yes. A lot of them, I've yes. seen them. You got to go. Yes. yes, and we need to jump to the last question connected with to everything we have talked about but remember to prepare questions for me i do i have so let me go let me go ahead and ask you okay. let us know chances uh for mumia's incarceration we have talked already about that yeah is there any hope? so the other um uh i mean i'm thinking of the of when President Chavez came to the United Nations and did that amazing, amazing performance, which I will never, it was the greatest moments of his life. The devil. The smell of sulfur. The smell of sulfur. So if we, maybe we need someone to come to the, to the United Nations again and do something around only like that. But anyway, my questions are the following. One, of course, I hear, I mean, I hear from my friend, William Kamakaro and just, the sad, sad stories of COVID. And um, so my first question is, what is the, um, is there any anything in sight to improve the situation? And my second question is um, much harder to answer. Um, how is the struggle for, you know, democracy going on in this period of, you know, so many attacks from the United States? How is the democratic struggle the building of communes, as uh, you know, all that, the gardens, so many wonderful democratic initiatives that had been going on. So how's that going? Those are my two questions. That's a good question. Those are two good questions. The first one, I believe, I mean, we has been in Venezuela very affected by the blockade, not only the US, but the European one. A lot of people talk, talk about the US blockade, but I, I, yeah. I like to like that it's not only the US, it's the US and his, I mean, it's European partners uh, or allies or whatever. Uh, so, so we have been for already uh, more than, I don't know, five, six years in the middle of a brutal attack no, I mean, Venezuelans, and I believe that no Latin American countries besides Cuba have suffered such harsh attack from the US and Europe in recent decades. Uh, and of course that have affects the, the capacity of the state and the government to respond to anything. Mm -hmm. So health is not an exception. So uh, I believe that our, our health system is, has been weak a lot, weakened a lot because of that reality. Uh, uh, but if you ask me, I believe that our numbers in terms of how Venezuela has been dealing with COVID are amazing. I mean, the, the approach, the responsibility that President Maduro have shown, have shown in dealing with the pandemic, I respect 
expected a lot. I mean, uh, we have been always since the very beginning, since the very case was reported, uh, we has been dealing with the pandemic with a lot of responsibility. Mm -hmm. mm, uh, immediately after the fake first case was reported, uh, the government launched an initiative of going house by house to identify cases. Uh, we immediately ordered the use of face masks without the crazy bipartisanship that you see in the US about the use of face masks and things like that. Uh, uh, I mean, and the, I believe that the, the people itself uh, uh, was, I mean, we Venezuelans, we knew that the, the, the health system was in very bad shape and we took the responsibility of follow the, the bio safety instructions, the, 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 the social distancing guidelines, uh, the best we can in order to improve, I mean, in order to not to fall into what we were seeing in Europe at that time. And then in the US and then in, in Brazil and Colombia, in, in, in a lot of countries. And we have, I have to tell you that we are, we are surrounded by, by, by countries with a catastrophic numbers in terms of codes. We have Brazil, we have Colombia. Uh, and uh, I mean, uh, and because of that, I'm very proud because, uh, and, and a few months after the pandemic started, yes, because of the pressure of not having the economy paralyzed, President Maduro decided to use this reopening scheme that we call seven plus seven. Basically in Venezuela, we go into quarantine. It's a voluntary one. There are not curfews or crazy things like that. Uh, for one week, and then the other, there is a opening of the of the economy uh, or, and businesses in order to keep the economy alive. But we go back the, the the week, the next week to the quarantine, and we have been doing that for almost like what, like eight, like ten months, I believe, or eight, something like that. And in that. I believe it's in part the, 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 the answer for the great numbers. I mean, Venezuela, I didn't look at the last numbers, but I believe that we have like less than 2,700 deaths out of COVID. Wow. So, wow. so that's nothing if you compare that with 460,000 in Brazil and with 180 something in Colombia, 180 something thousand, I mean, uh, in Colombia, uh, so 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 I believe that is amazing the way in which we have been dealing with the pandemic. It's amazing, and you don't see the catastrophe that other countries have, including the U.S. I know that the U.S. right now is is uh, getting out of the catastrophe because of the vaccination, and I'm happy because of that, especially because I have a lot of friends in the U.S. Uh, but. Uh, but in that area, in the area of a vaccination, we have been, uh, you know, getting behind, not because we won, but because the, the same U.S. sanctions have limited our capacity to go outside and do stuff, buy things and do things like that. It's not that easy. But besides that, last, I mean, this, a few days ago, the government started like a mass vaccination campaign because we receive a, a big batch of vaccines from China, from Sinopharm, and, and, but we also have received a lot of vaccine, uh, vaccines from Russia. So basically that's our arsenal of vaccines, the, 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 the Russian one, Sputnik V, and, and, uh, and, uh, and the Chinese side from Sinopharm. And also we have deals with Cubans, uh, especially with the Abdala and Soberana one vaccine. And we have plans to also to manufacture the, the Abdala vaccine in Venezuela by mid of this year. So that's the whole plan. Uh, so I believe that, I hope that by August to this year, I will be vaccinated. That's my hope. I hope so too. I hope so too. <clears throat> Let me tell you uh, uh, about the second question. Uh, all the all the economic crisis that have come with U.S. sanctions and European sanctions and blockade has affected, as I told you, the whole country, the whole state, the whole society, culture. I mean, and that uh, 
I cannot tell you a lie that have impacted also all those initiative of communes and, uh, and people democracy that I believe are the core of Chavismo, the core of the Bolivarian revolution. And, uh, but that doesn't mean that they are dead. The, 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 what that means is that, that we have a lot of Venezuelans right now trying to survive and yeah. they cannot dedicate the same energy that they dedicated to the revolution 10 years ago because we are, uh, I mean, a big chunk of Venezuelans are just looking right now to survive in the middle of the crisis. But I have to tell you also that uh, since 2018, President Maduro has taken uh, right economic decisions that I have the impression have uh, improved a little bit the economic situation uh, uh, that we had until that year, until 2018. So I'm optimistic if you ask me, uh, even though we are in the middle of this terrible crisis. And I believe that 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 we, in terms of building uh, a, a real popular democracy that most Chavista want, uh, uh, we are going. We are in the right path, uh, not in the right moment, but in the right path because. Uh, uh, the, the state is pushing, for example, in the, in the National Assembly in Venezuela, they are discussing right now the law for communal cities, for example. The law, um, also the law for communal cities. Communal cities. It's like, the, 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 it's like a new framework for connected communes with the territory. You know what I mean? Yes. So, so it's like a new legal framework that, in my opinion, and from what I have read, uh, will allow the, the building of a national commune infrastructure that I hope that eventually we be, will be able to, 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 to run the country. That's my, my, my wish, at least. Viva, that's uh, wonderful. I love yeah. hearing it. I love hearing it. And we have also the parliamentary, uh, the, the commune par parliament law that is also being discussed right now in the con in the National Assembly. A few days ago, uh, Diosdado Cabello, which is the second most important Chavista, uh, I mean, authority in Venezuela, Diosdado Cabello, uh, visit Comuna El Maizal, and I was very happy because Comuna El Maizal is, is an agro production commune that is based in Lara State and is very famous. And he visited them, and they were encouraged by the visit of, of Josao Cabello, and it was something that was not planned. And we published, we posted something in Orinoco Tribuna about it a few days ago, and those are the things that you know, give me the impression that we, as I told you, are in, the, in, a, in a bad moment, but we still have the right path to follow. So I'm optimistic about that. I, I, I believe that we will need to do a lot of more stuff to strengthen the, the, the whole commune and communal system, but, but, but we're doing okay. I'm optimistic. That's wonderful. Well, what a pleasure to talk with you. What a pleasure. <laughs> it, was, it was also my pleasure talking to you and to be updated about the whole complexity of the Mumia case and of the MOVE uh, organization and the MOVE, you know, events that have been happening recently. And I wish you the best. And I hope that you can come back to Venezuela anytime oh, soon. And of course, we're rooting... I mean, what a source of hope Venezuela is. What a source of hope to the whole world, really. Thank you. Thank Trem you, Suzanne. Thank you. And uh, I believe that, that, that we should stop the, 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 the broadcasting right now. You can stay with me for a second if you want to finish up talking. Thank Hold you. on a second. I have to click a few buttons here. Uh,